Hi everyone, today I want to present you a concept that I find really fascinating, the diagonal argument. It refers to a scheme of proof using an infinite set in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of natural numbers. It is in this context that it has been used the first time by Contour to demonstrate that real numbers are uncountable. In other words, that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the real numbers and natural numbers. It appears that diagonal argument is way more than a proof on infinite sets. You will see that it is also a powerful tool to make self-reference statement that leads to result about limitation on mathematics itself. A lot of mathematicians have used it in this purpose, such as the Gödel incompleteness theorem, the Turing halting problem, and the Tarski undefinability theorem, and others. In this video, I will apply the diagonal argument to prove three theorems so that you will be familiar with it. Then I will show you that there is a meta theorem based on diagonal argument for which all these theorems are just an instance. And finally, we will come back to our example in light of the meta theorem, and this will make things very clear about the essence of diagonal argument. I will assume that you have an intermediate level in math and that you are already familiar with set theory. Otherwise, this will be the opportunity for you to understand it. So let's begin with our first application of the proof, the uncountability of real numbers. We want to prove with diagonal arguments that real numbers are uncountable, which means that the set of real numbers has no objection with the set of natural numbers. So first, we proceed by contradiction. Let's suppose it is the case, real numbers are countable. Then there must exist a list of all real numbers indexed by A, and each decimal is indexed by G. The order of real numbers doesn't matter here. We can represent this list in a table where rows are real numbers and columns are decimals. Let's define now a diagonal number. It is the real number for which i and g are equals. Logically, whatever are the decimals of d, this is a real number. But now we define some sort of counter d, which is never equal to the decimals of d for the same index. And if you think about it, counter d is different from each d decimal of the number of the table. So it can't be in the rows of this table. But on the other hand, counter d should be a real number, like any other decimal sequence. So this is a contradiction. Our assumption was wrong. So we get back on our feet. Real numbers are indeed uncountable. This was the diagonal argument. Again, if you are unfamiliar with this, replay the explanation at your rhythm. So you may think that this is very complex, but starting from now until the end of the video, I will repeat this same shame again and again. I want to show you that there is a common backbone between all use of diagonal arguments. Let's continue with the halting problem. The theorem states that in any programming language or Turing machine, there doesn't exist a special program that takes a program and its arguments and tell if the program stop or run forever. So let's try to prove this. We proceed again by contradiction. So we assume there exists such a program that resolves the halting problem. Let's call it H. And H has two inputs, a program P and an argument M applied on that program. H return 1 if P applied on M is halting and 0 if it doesn't halt. And we assume that programs are sequence of symbols defined on a finite 
alphabet. We do not prove this here, but the set of programs is countable. So there is an enumeration of all programs. Let's P and M be actually the index of the programs and arguments it encode. We can then display the table of H evaluated on all programs and arguments. So we define the diagonal term D, which is the result of programs evaluated on themselves. But we also define counter D, which returns the inverse status of D. Now, what can we say about counter D evaluated on itself? Does it halt? It's hard to say. Let's assume it halts. Then by construction, counter D of D is 1. But since counter D is doing the opposite of D, counter D evaluated on itself should halt too. So maybe it doesn't halt. But if it doesn't halt, D of counter D is 0. But again, counter D does the opposite of D, so it should also halt. If you are a normal human being, it makes some time to get it. So don't hesitate to pause the video. So in any case, we are in a contradiction. So indeed, we can state that no special program can resolve the halting problem. I hope you are starting to see the backbone. We assume the opposite. There is always an enumeration, a diagonal term, a counter diagonal term, and a contradiction. Let's see now our last example, the indefinability theorem of Tarski. This theorem states that no arithmetic formula can decide the truth value of any arithmetic statement. As usual, we suppose here that such formula f exists. We are dealing with arithmetic statements, which are first order logic formula. So this is a sequence of finite alphabet. It is then countable. We can map an index to every arithmetic statement. So f takes two inputs. S the index of the statement we want to know the truth. And v is the index of the variable on which the statement s depends. Then f returns the truth value of the statement s applying applied on variable v. Again, we can represent in a table the truth value of all statements applied on all variables. Again, we define the diagonal d, the truth of statement applied on themselves. But we also define counter d, the negation of the result of d. Now, does the statement counter d is true when applied on itself. Like for the halting problem, we end in the same situation, whatever is equal counter D. We end in a contradiction, so the assumption was false. And we can state that no arithmetic formula can decide the truth of any statement. Now that you have in mind the shame of diagonal argument, Let's try to understand it on another level of abstraction. Diagonal argument is shared between a lot of mathematical results. But one theorem is a generalization of all diagonal argument. This is the Lover theorem. Before digging into this theorem, you should know that this is a result from a field called category theory. But since it brings a lot of complexity here, I decided to follow the approach angle of this paper from Nozon Janowski that says it in a nice way. It is our goal to make these amazing results, the lower theorem, available to a larger audience. Toward this aim, we restate Lover's theorem without using the language of category theory. Instead, we use sets and functions. So, we will forget about category theory here as well and think in terms of sets and functions. So, what states Lover theorem? 
for all y, if a function alpha from y to i has no fixed point, then for all set a, no function is subjective from a to y power a. This is perfectly normal if you don't see a link with the previous theorem, it will come. To prove this theorem, we will use again the diagonal argument. But first, let's rewrite it in an equivalent way to ease the proof. We rewrite the statement by expanding the definition of non-surjectivity. It gives, for all a and f, we can always construct a function g from y to a, such that for all a in capital A, f of a is always different from the function g. As a reminder, our function f is a function of one variable that return a function of another variable that return a value of y. And this is equivalent with a function of two variables that return a value of y. And it is more simple. This is called curing. For the proof, we will consider the later. So let's begin the proof. Our goal is to construct the function g. We will define two functions for this aim. First, the diagonal function, delta, which take a variable a and return a pair of that same variable. Then the no fixed point function alpha for all y of capital Y. Alpha of y is always different of y. Now we define j by composition. j is alpha of f of delta. For all a, let's evaluate g of a. By construction, we can rewrite the expression as alpha of f of a and a. But if we apply the no fixed point properties, it's clear that g of a is never equal to f of a and a. But since it is called by alpha, it is always different. In other words, a to y to the power of a is not surjective. At this point, the alpha function, the diagonal function, g and f, should remind you something. This is exactly the backbone of diagonal argument, reduced to the essential. But we are on another level of abstraction, so it is applicable to any set A and Y. The schema of composition on the left is an accurate summary of what is going on during diagonal argument. So now we will go back to the previous proof and look for the function f, g, alpha, delta and see if it is comparable. So for the uncountability of real numbers, let's rewrite the diagram of the proof but with the actual sets. And let's try to understand each function and set equivalence. So A is the natural numbers. It comes from the assumption that real numbers are countable. Y is a digit from 0 to 9 because we used decimal system to represent real numbers. F is our double indexed list L, a function that is supposed to be subjective. G is counter D, a counter example that F will never reach. D is a composition of F and delta. And alpha is a non-fixed point function. From this element, we can unfold the proof of lower theorems and say that no f can be surjective between n and 10 to the power of n. In other words, the set of real numbers is uncountable. Now, for the halting problem, it is slightly different because instead of decimal sequence, we worked with binary sequence. So A is still related to the natural numbers because we admitted that programs were countable. Y is the set 2, which contains 0 and 1, the two states that the program can return, halt or 
not hot. F is associated with our special program H, G to counter D, D is the composition of F and delta, alpha is some sort of negation operation on binary digit, which has no fixed point. Here again, if we unfold the proof of Lovell, we can say that n to 2 power n is not subjective. In other words, the set of programs and the set of all possible statues returned by programs for each argument have no bijection. This is very relevant for programs. There are as many programs as natural numbers, but there are as many possible input-output mapping configuration as there are real numbers. This means that there are infinitely more functions that will never be computable by a program than those who will. And for the last case, I will be brief because this video is already too long. This is very close to the halting problem. Instead of programs, we have arithmetic statement and instead of input argument, we have variable of statements. n to 2 power n is not subjective by lower and in other words, it means that there are as many arithmetic statements as there are natural numbers. But there are as many possible mapping between a variable taken by an assertion and returned truth as there are real numbers. This means that no single assertion from a countable set can manage to define the truth of each assertion depending of its variable from an uncountable set. Okay, so proofs are over. It's now time to step back and think to what we have seen. Diagonal arguments all state something different but in the same way. It seems that the only change are the initial context on which you apply it. I've recently read a summary in one line of diagonal argument. I think it can make sense to you now. It says, when you apply diagonal argument on a system, you are telling him predict something about yourself and do the opposite. I like to think that it is like putting a malware into a computer. Whatever reads this in its own language, arithmetic, programs, natural numbers, natural language, there will be some kind of crash of the system. Once more, I would like to quote a subsection of the paper from Nozon Janowski, who nicely said about diagonal arguments, the layer paradox is a 3000 year old primary example that shows that natural language should not talk about their own truthfulness. Russell's paradox shows that naive set theory is inherently flawed because sets can talk about their own properties. Gödel incompleteness results show that arithmetic cannot talk completely about its own probability. Turing's halting problem showed that computer cannot completely deal with the property of whether a computer will halt or go into an infinite loop. All these different examples are really saying the same things. There will be trouble when things deal with their own properties. It's over. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Do not hesitate to subscribe could have a side effect that makes me want to produce more content and see you next time.